the last nine weeks. Um, we've studied how um, the journey began for the early church. Um, today we're going to kind of see a shift from the beginning of the journey, where the journey begins, into crisis and success. Um, we've read Christ's command that we're, we are to be as witnesses all across the earth. Um, we've seen how the apostles were told to wait for the arrival of the Spirit, and how they spend that time waiting in prayer. We observed that how, upon the Spirit's arrival, the apostles were powered up by God to declare the resurrection of Christ to so many people in their own language, and that 3,000 were saved, baptized, and added to the church. Over the next few weeks, we're going to see that shift of how in this success, the apostles will have to operate in the midst of crisis. Today we will observe how Peter and John are questioned by the High Council for their declaration of Jesus Christ. We'll see that how even this is not going to stop them from proclaiming in a pickle. That's what I've entitled this sermon, is Proclamation in a Pickle. So um, if you'll join me, uh, find your place in Acts chapter 4. We're going to be in verse, um, starting in verse 1 of Acts chapter 4. When you find your place there, go ahead and stand with me um, as we read. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were high priests in the center. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as of being with Jesus. And seeing the man who, was, who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we also cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among these people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. When they had summoned them back in, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus Christ. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been. Lord, I come to you this morning asking you to be filled with the Spirit. God, I ask that you use my mouth, use my words um, to speak the truth of your word. God, I ask that what I say today is true, that it comes from you. And that if anything that I say is not true, but is of my own opinion, God, that it's forgotten, that it's disregarded. Father, you get all the glory in this. It's all for you. And I will praise you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. So we are returning right where Pastor left off last week in our um, 
continuation of our series. Um, if you remember, Peter and John had traveled to the temple in order to pray. It was the, there was the time set aside of the day um, to pray, and they were headed to the temple in order to do that. And while they were there, they came across a lame beggar who had strategically positioned himself outside Gate Beautiful, which was, if we remember, it was the gate leading into the Gentile court, um, which um, would have been the opportunity for him to make the most money he possibly could have, asking the most people he could. Um, so when Peter and John were asked, um, Peter declared to the lame man, look at me, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I offer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say to you, get up and walk. And we learn how the healed man not only got up and walked, but was leaping around the temple, praising God for what had happened. Um, we also know how the people around him were perplexed. They noticed this man leaping around the temple, um, and they um, were unsure of what was going on, because they recognized him as the beggar who had asked them for money. So Peter then begins to declare the message of Jesus' resurrection, whom they had denounced in ignorance, as we talked about last week. So this is where we're picking up the story. Peter and John are still in the temple, they're still in the Gentile court, preaching God's name um, to these people, and Peter has just finished giving his message. At the start of chapter 4, we see a conflict arise. It says, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So the conflict arises between the Sadducees against Peter and John. Peter and John are declaring Christ's resurrection in the house of prayer to a crowd of Jews that were all in the temple. So there's this crowd of people gathered together, all congregated, listening to what Peter has to say, and the Sadducees come in and they're like, What's going on? They see this crowd, and they hear what Peter is talking about, and it says they were greatly disturbed. I don't know about you, but I'm, I like to look at the meaning in the original language of the uh, specific words, because some words get translated and they have multiple meanings, uh, and sometimes it just doesn't do it justice. So I looked up this word, disturbed, of what it meant in the Greek, and um, I found out that the Greek word means troubled, displeased, or offended. So the Sadducees are all worked up about what's going on um, over what Peter and John are declaring, so much so that they grab the trained guards of the temple to take care of them. So imagine this. Here's Peter, here's John preaching the word of God, and all of a sudden they see campus security rolling up to detain them. And we see... Uh, I've been in different uh, uh, services where the pastor may use an illustration that may be a little on edge to get um, a captive audience. And you see people get up in the back and they're like, oh, where's he going with this? Um, as we talked about, Greg Steer used an example in our video in Sunday School a few weeks ago. Um, but that's what I'm imagining here. Um, it's a little bit different. But um, that's what I'm imagining. Peter and John are proclaiming, and all of a sudden they see these guys. They're like, oh, no, we're not going to have this in the temple. And so they grab them. Um, verse 3 says, And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So Peter and John are put into a temple holding cell overnight for preaching the word of God. But why were the Sadducees so upset? Well, to understand that, we have to understand what a Sadducee is. And um, you're more than welcome to look to it. But Luke 20, 27 informs us that the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. Um, this is why they're so offended of Peter and John's proclamation. Because Peter and John were proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, not only that, but they were proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, whom the Jews rejected in ignorance. These were the same people who, just a few months ago, crucified Jesus. They were, the, they were there. Um, and Peter tells them it's an ignorance, but ignorant sin is still sin. So the Jews rejected it, and he's proclaiming the resurrection that Christ did not stay dead, but that he arose from the grave and ascended back to the Father. So thus we see the temple guards lay hands on Peter and John, but we don't see Peter and John fight back. Instead we see them stand down in persecution. 
So what's the big idea of putting Peter and John in a holding cell? What do they intend on doing with them the next day? Why stick them in a prison cell overnight? Were they getting ready to treat them for their warm bread and, bed and breakfast package after arresting them? I don't think so. Because um, uh, I was doing some study and found out that it was actually illegal for the Sanhedrin, who were the um, high council, the elders, and, or the high priests who um, would hold court, it was illegal for them to hold court at night. So, they placed Peter and uh, John in a holding cell overnight in order to take um, the court to the next day. So, if we read verse 4, um, we see that, But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So, all of this crisis was not in vain. Because following God's call is never in vain even if we perceive no gain. But in this case, there is gain. In the midst of their persecution, many were brought to Christ. Not only that, but we see a difference of opinion between the Sadducees and the, Jew the Jews of Jerusalem. We'll continue to see how that difference affects the outcome of Peter and John's court, um, court trial. So on the next day, verse 5, it says, On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were high priests in the center. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power, or in what name, have you done this? So day two started. In between verses four and five, the night has passed, and it's the day of the trial. So we see Peter and John placed at the center of the court, in front of the Sanhedrin. And we see that um, uh, the, they would have been required to have witnesses there. So the healed layman is there, and many witnesses who were there, who heard the message of Peter, were there um, with Peter and John. We also see that Annas is there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander. Now, who are those people? Like, why, why, why does Luke go to the trouble of mentioning them? Um, if we look back um, at some of the recorded Gospels, we'll actually find the answer to some of that question of who they were. So if you turn to John 18, um, we're going to see who Annas and Caiaphas were. John 18, 13 says, um, And they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. So Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest that year, and these two men were two of the men who Jesus stood trial before his crucifixion. Um, but as far as John and Alexander, this is the only time they are recorded in the scriptures. Um, so, outside of this, we have no information of who they are. But, if we remember who the book is written to, remember Luke wrote this book of Acts, the Acts of God through the Apostles, and he wrote it to Theophilus. So, we can make an inference that Theophilus probably knew who John and Alexander were because Luke mentioned them by name. Um, so, um, Annas is the father of Caiaphas. Caiaphas holds the office of high priest. We know that Pentecost was 50 days after Passover, and we know that Christ died the week of Passover. And if you read Leviticus, believe it or not, you'd also find out that Passover took place the first month of the year, in the month of Nisan, according to the Jewish calendar. Um, so this means Caiaphas would have also just recently received the position of high priest. So now that we know that all, who all these people are, to some regard, um, we see at the end here that a question is asked. When they placed them at the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? So here stands Peter, in the same room, likely, that he stood at the beginning of that year, when he denied to even know Jesus, when he relied on his own power 
and failed miserably. But this time he has a second chance. He's been told previously by Jesus that he would be in this position. If you turn to Matthew 10, we'll see that this was no surprise to Peter of where he was standing. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 16. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it's not, who you, it's not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. So this is what's happening. This is where Peter's set before men, set before leaders, in a spot where he's being questioned for what God has told him to do. But Jesus has promised him, you will not have to come up with the words to say because God will speak through you the power of the Spirit. So look at verse 8. So the question is asked, by what power or what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers, elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but became the very chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So Peter is filled with the Spirit. Peter receives power through the Spirit to proclaim truth. It's the filling in of the Spirit in the moment that gives Peter the strength to declare God's truth simply and straightforwardly. This is the answer to one of the questions asked by the Sanhedrin. By what power have you done this? And it's the answer to the same question that's asked so often, even today. By what power does he declare God so boldly? The answer is, it's the power of God. It's the power of the Spirit of the living God. So we see Peter's filled with the Spirit. And Peter challenges the question. And he takes advantage of his captive audience. Because Peter is held captive under questioning. But who's really being questioned here? Because Peter takes advantage of his captive audience. And he answers the question. Let it be known to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, or by this name, this man stands before you in good health. So through the power of the Spirit, Peter makes his declaration. He addresses his focus toward the Sanhedrin, so that they and all of Israel may know the truth. It is only by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom the man whom they crucified, the man that God raised from the dead, that this man is standing. It's only because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again three days later, according to the scriptures, to proclaim power and victory over death. That's the only name, that's the only reason that this man can be healed, because there is no other name. He says, he is a stone which, re was, which was rejected by you, the builders. but which became the chief cornerstone. We see an example to follow from Peter. Because how easy would it have been for Peter to take credit for the healing of this man and make it about himself? But he doesn't. He focuses on Jesus and the importance of Christ. In verse 11, he sees, you, you see him continue and make it applicable. He is a stone which was rejected by you, the builders. He being Jesus. Jesus Christ was a stone. And he was rejected by the builders, the Sanhedrin, the same people who crucified him earlier that year. 
But that portion, that portion was added to make it personal, to make it apply, to show the fulfillment of the prophecy. But we see a change. We see a change there. He was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. So a cornerstone, a cornerstone is the first stone that's set when constructing um, a, mas a masonry foundation. Um, it's incredibly important because all the other stones are set in reference to the cornerstone. In the same way, Jesus is the first stone set in our foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone. And all of the other sto stones of our life should be put in reference to that cornerstone. But it's when we choose to place our stones in reference to our own desires that make the towers of our life crumble and fall. But Peter didn't make up this prophecy himself. Um, we actually, it's, believe it or not, it's in Psalm 118, the same psalm that we've been going through this morning. Um, psalm 118, starting in verse 21, it says, I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So this shows God as our salvation. It, said, it shows that God is our salvation before <coughs> Jesus was even set. Um, because this psalm was made in the Old Testament before Jesus had come to this earth. It shows that salvation was still in Christ. But it is only because of God that we can receive this salvation. Because it was only God that could perform such a task that could bridge that separation from our sin. We see Peter actually use this uh, prophecy, this scripture, more than once. This is, um, th there's a second time he uses this, at least a second time, um, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Starting in verse 6, it says, uh, for this is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. So that all said is for those who believe. Christ is a precious stone, and he who believes in Christ will not be disappointed. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. So Peter quotes this prophecy again, using it against those who do not believe. The stone which the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And Jesus is the foundation of life, whether you choose to admit it or not. The only thing that your recognition and submission to that fact does is determines your own personal salvation. Because you can believe your whole life that Jesus is not God. You can believe that Jesus did not raise again, but that doesn't change the truth that he did and he is. He's still in control. And he is the cornerstone. So Peter continues and says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I can't interpret this verse any better than it's written. But in case you missed it, Jesus is the only means of salvation. There is no other way. It doesn't matter how many times you come to church. It doesn't matter how many nonprofit organizations you're involved with. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you've done in your life. It doesn't matter because none of that stuff can bridge that gap of separation that comes from our sin. There is no other way. Christ was given by God, placed among men, for the purpose of salvation. Nothing else measures up. So although, yes, Peter and John stand down in persecution, they do not hesitate to stand up in truth. So that's Peter's response. In verse 13 it says, Now as they, being the same Hedrian, the high council, observed the confidence of Peter and John, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say 
and reply. So the Sanhedrin recognizes this boldness of Peter and John. Peter has just completely wiped the floor, brought it up. Jesus is the only means of salvation, and you have rejected him. And they see, they literally have nothing to say in response. And they see how Peter and John weren't educated men, because they weren't. They were fishermen. That was their trade. They didn't have seminary degrees. They didn't spend four years at Grace College or Cedarville University to know all the ins and outs of scriptures. But they did have something else. And the Sanhedrin understood it and recognized it. They had spent time with Jesus. They chose to abide in Christ. Thus, God abides in them. And we see that through the filling of the Spirit. There's a cause and effect relationship because of the time spent with God, they receive power through the Spirit. We also, in order to be powered up, in order to have those conversations and boldness with the people who do not know Him as Christ, we have to be spending time with God. How do we do that? Well, there are a lot of Bible studies here at Warsaw Baptist Church that you can take part in. We have them all throughout our week. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of things you can be involved with. But on, on a more serious note, it's being in the Word of God. And not to say that those Bible studies aren't serious, because I mean, I'm, I'm serious. You can, you can be a part of this. But um, the being uh, abiding in God comes with placing Him first. It's being in the Scripture. It's praying. It's being setting time aside in your day to just be with God. And honestly, I challenge you guys to do that. Because when you're spending time with God, when you're abiding in love, love that abides in you, and it affects the way you live. If you turn those stones in reference to Christ, your life becomes much simpler. Your paths become straight. Um, so let's look at verse 15. Um, when they had ordered them to leave the council... They began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. So Peter and John have made their claim. The council sees it. They recognize that they're untrained men who haven't had this degree and they cast them out. They cast them out of the um, council because they start to talk amongst themselves. They're talking, what are we going to do? Like, what, what, what can we do? Obviously, what they're saying is true. We know because we were the ones who hired the people, the, the guards at the, the tomb, to spread lies that Christ was dead. They knew the truth. They continued to reject the truth. And the fact that they saw the boldness even the unsaved saw that Peter and John were men of God. So they confirm amongst themselves, what are we going to do? We cannot disprove it. That would be the easiest way to do it, to shut this all down altogether, disprove the fact that Christ is risen, but we don't have any way of doing that. So since we don't have any means of disproving this proclamation of Peter and John, why don't we threaten them and order them to just stop talking about it altogether? We can suppress this truth from being spread so that it won't be um, spread out any further among the people. So that we can still hold um, the position, we can still hold that power over the people of Israel. So, verse 18, they, when they had summoned them back in, they called them back in, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus Christ. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So the command is given to Peter and John. They think they're so wise and cunning. They're like, oh, we got this. We're going to tell them to stop. And then Peter comes in and he's like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> he's like, Peter responds, again standing up in that truth. And he says, What's more pleasing to God? 
Is it more pleasing to God that we listen to God and what He says? Or that we listen to you and what you tell us to do? You guys have the degrees. You guys know what you're talking about. You guys have studied the law. Why don't you tell me? But we cannot stop speaking about the things we have seen and heard. Again, I looked up this word for cannot uh, because I wanted to see what it was referring to and their inability. But it literally means incapable or it's impossible. So it is impossible for us to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Wait a second. Don't, don't, we, have the, don't we have the ability of free will in order to make our own decisions? Well, yeah. But if we look back at Acts 1a, um, we see that Christ gives us the promise that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, and even into the remotest parts of the earth. So they were given a command by Jesus Christ himself to be witnesses of what they have seen and what they have heard. And if you look at verse 22, the second half of that, one of these must become a witness with us of this resurrection. Is that, um, so that shows the command that God has placed on the apostles. And we see that there is an assurance that the apostles are obedient in submission to Christ's command. And that's what Peter's saying. We've been given the command. I'm one of the twelve. He's one of the twelve. And we made an oath that we will be witnesses. We can't break that oath. Verse 21. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years on whom this miracle of healing had been taking place. So the council continues to threaten the apostles, maybe warning them that this conflict wasn't over. And we're going to see through the continuation of our series exactly what that means um, and the more crisis that is yet to come. But they had no legal convictions of which to hold Peter and John. They didn't have anything they could hold them to to keep them detained. And they saw the response of the people, the Jews, the, the Jews of Jerusalem, how they were all glorifying God for what had happened. So they released Peter and John to prevent any uh, further rioting or any rioting at all. But also to, ma to maintain self-perceived authority and trust over Israel. They wanted to hold that position, that power of what they thought they had. As we continue our series, we're going to see how Peter and John move forward. This morning we've been showed that even in the midst of conflict, it's important to hold on to what is true. By spending time with Jesus, we remember that Jesus is the only means of salvation. Because we need the gospel just as much today as we did the day of our salvation. We're reminded that we have been given the task of being God's witnesses. And we saw that through the filling of that spirit, we can find boldness to stand up in truth. And that we were promised that filling of that spirit and that we can stand in that promise and stand in truth. I'm going to ask you now to... Bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you've never heard this truth before. Perhaps today is the first time you've ever heard about God's free gift of eternal life. If that's you, I invite you to make a decision today to accept that gift. In a moment, we're going to sing a hymn, and you'll be given the opportunity to walk up here and learn how to gain that free gift of eternal life. There's no reason to be afraid. There's no special mantra or any special words that you are required to say. And the people you're going to pass by, let them be joyful for your decision to recognize Christ as chief cornerstone in your life. Perhaps you've already have been given this gift. You've already received this gift. But God is laying something else on your heart. Maybe you've been doubting God's power to work through you in your spheres of influence. Maybe you've been battling with the control factor of your life. I challenge you to examine yourself. Really look into your life and identify if something is holding you back from being an effective witness for Christ. 
I invite you to walk forward this morning and present yourself to God to renew your relationship with Him. Father, I pray, I pray that this time is a time where people reflect. God, I ask that you work on the hearts of the ones sitting here. That if there is one sitting here this morning who has not placed their trust in you, who's declared you as Lord of their life, God, I ask that today be the day of their salvation. That they can experience what it is to be saved. And they can find hope in your name and experience that relationship. God, I pray for boldness. I pray that you fill these people with courage to come forward. And Father, we will give all the praise to you. I pray all these names.